Thank you so much for joining us for the Pet Parent Webinar, uh, Pet Shaw's Pause and Learn. I'm Chief Veterinary Officer at Pet Shaw, and I'm your host and moderator for today's session. Tonight's webinar on setting your new pet up for success is brought to you by Pet Shaw and Dr. Kirsty Sexel. Pet Shaw is a company of animal lovers providing a sense of security to pet parents through pet insurance. PetShaw powers the pet insurance propositions of many well-known brands, including Woolworths, RSPCA, and many others. Additionally, PetShaw has revolutionized the claim experience with the development of Gap Only. If you'd like to find out more about PetShaw or Gap Only, please visit our website. Before we begin, I'd like to run you through some housekeeping items. The webinar will run for about 45 minutes, followed by a 10 to 15 minute question and answer session. On the screen, you should see a control panel to your right. If you experience any problems during the webinar, please submit your issue within the question panel and we'll try and resolve it for you. During the webinar, all phone lines will be muted to reduce background noise. If you have a question for the presenters, please post your question in the question panel. The speaker for tonight's webinar is Dr. Kirsty Sexel. Kirsty is a recognised behavioural medicine specialist and is recognised by the Australian, American and European colleges. Kirsty is also an adjunct associate professor, professor at Charles Sturt University Wagga Wagga and a fear-free certified professional. She is fascinated by animals and why they do what they do. She's passionate about helping people understand animals better so she can improve the lives of people and their pets. Kirsty pioneered puppy preschool and kitten kindy classes, teaches the distance education course in behavioural medicine at the University of Sydney. She presents at conferences nationally and internationally, runs webinars, writes textbook chapters, and has written a book, Training Your Cat, and is a regular presenter on radio and TV. So without any further delay, I'd now like to hand you over to Dr. Sexel. Hi everybody, welcome to tonight um, and thank you Danny for that lovely introduction and allowing me to talk about setting your pet up for success. And I thought really the best way to do this is for people to understand why do pets do what they do because that leads to a lot of misunderstandings and I found, um, and I love saying this, I've been t teaching and talking about behaviour in animals since last millennium which makes me feel very wise rather than old. But what it, I think a lot of it is a misunderstanding how animals perceive the world. So I think the best way to set your pet up success, to, for success is actually to understand them. So when I um, first started doing this, um, then what I found was that people were saying, no, no, bad dog, stop that, you know, and I always thought the dogs thought, well, my name is no, no, bad dog, what's yours? Because that's all they ever heard. And really, behaviour has moved a long, past, a long way past that. And really, you know, there are no bad dogs. Uh, it's just that we don't understand the dogs that we do have. So this is what tonight is aiming to help you understand your dog or your cat a little bit better. And what that really entails is understanding behaviour. And when we talk about behaviour, we're really talking about acting in a socially acceptable manner. And I really like the word socially in there because as society changes, our expectations of animals change. And I've always thought that we shouldn't be talking about responsible pet ownership, we should be talking about socially responsible pet ownership. Because when I was growing up, dogs weren't worked on a leash, nobody picked up their poop after them, and society just accepted that's why it is. But nowadays, that's not socially acceptable any longer. And I think this, if we keep that in mind that what is acceptable at one time may not be acceptable at another, um, it really helps us, I guess, work with the pets that we uh, hopefully love and live with rather than live with and not love so much. So behaviour really describes what happens in a specific context at a specific time. So when someone tells me their dog is doing X or Y, um, it really is only what's happening at that particular instant in time. It doesn't tell me what happened three minutes earlier and it certainly doesn't necessarily predict the future. 
And what I want to stress to you tonight is that any change in behaviour may be the first indication of a problem. It may be a medical problem, a physical problem, or it could be a behavioural or what I call an emotional problem. Because really, unless you're going for a general health check or wellness check to the vet, most of the times people will come and see their vet is because the dog or the cat or the rabbit or whatever, um, something in their behaviour has changed. And as I said, it could be a medical or physical reason that needs to be invested but it may also be a behavioural or emotional reason that we need to look at. So let's look at dogs for a minute and, I, and there's a lot of misunderstandings about why dogs do what they do because we know that dogs evolved from the wolf and really they're not wolves at all. Um, and this is what I just want to spend a couple of minutes uh, talking about because if we don't understand where dogs came from and we relate things to always being, you know, the wolf in our in our lounge room, that's going to really mislead what our current dogs, the dogs that we live to day to day, um, behave like, feel like, and what their emotions are all about. So. What are dogs? Well, there's a, lum, a, number of, a large number of species that come under that uh, label of Canada. And what the domestic dog is, it, we do know it evolved from the wolf, but there may have been other ancestors. And, and there's different theories depending on which book you read, um, of which wolf it actually uh, evolved from. And... Um, what we do know is dogs became domesticated over 150,000 years ago. So when people talk about dogs and wolves being the same, well, they're really not the same at all. Dogs were pets about 12,000 years ago. And this picture I really liked because it's from Ein Malaha in um, Israel and it's a burial site where there's the woman buried with a puppy under her arm. And it's obvious if you're going to get buried with something, it's obviously something very precious to you. So we considered as a human species dogs as being important in our lives 12,000 years ago. The domestic dog since that um, time has been selectively bred for various purposes. So um, you can see from that picture, there's large dogs and small dogs. And, and what we've wanted from them is different uh, attributes we've selected for. And now there's well over 400 dog breeds worldwide. And if you think about the crosses and the crosses and the crosses, um, there's a lot of different breeds that are around, some of which are recognized by the dog uh, breeding associations and some not. But if we go back to the role of the first dog, it really varied. We really liked dogs hanging around us when we were um, nomadic and then we started to set up roots because dogs were our early warning system. They barked to warn us that some danger was potentially coming. So think about this, we actually liked dogs that barked because they were our early warning system system. They were also our garbage disposal system. Okay, so when we had waste, the dogs were there to clean up after us. Hmm, think about what dogs might do in your kitchen at times. And we also had dogs for companionship. And that's really one of the major um, reasons I think most of us have a dog. We don't necessarily want them to clean up the garbage for us. We certainly, well, I certainly like my dog barking when someone comes to the door, so I have my early warning system, but really my dog is there for companionship. We've also been selectively breeding them for different reasons. So we wanted dogs that would go hunting with us. We wanted dogs that herded, um, kept the sheep uh, all rounded up or the cattle rounded up. And we certainly wanted dogs to guard our uh, territories and I guess guard our, our, ourselves as well at times. So we've actually accentuated the traits of certain dogs for various purposes. Domestication is a really interesting thing that's happened with dogs. Um, what we know with domestication, it involves, it's a process that involves one or more changes in, um, in the morphology, which is the shape 
all the looks of the dog. It also involves changes in physiology and it involves changes in behavioural traits. And an example of um, what we have seen with domestication is that dogs not only do they not look like wolves, but they don't behave like wolves. And when there were some experiments done many, many years ago looking at different species, if they selected for their behaviour, i.e. I'm going to select, and this is an experiment done on foxes, the foxes that are very, very friendly to humans, um, the foxes changed in their shape, size, colour, they started to look more like border collies. And instead of just coming into season once a year, they came into season twice a year, which is exactly what we see um, with our present day domestic dogs. And again, if you think about what a wolf looks like, um, well, maybe the dog on the left is as close as we're going to get to a wolf, maybe the shepherd, but you can see the others really in shape, size, colour, variation, don't resemble their ancestors at all. And move this along and if you look at these two um, well there's not much wolf like about about them at all perhaps only you know they are trying to look fierce because of their uh, accoutrements that they've got around their neck and around their ankles so if you look at the domestic dog now they come in all sorts of long hairs short hairs um, different colors different ear shapes floppy ears prick ears and the behavior of all of these dogs is very very different from the wolf there are breed differences, but um, mostly more dogs are more, are more are really like other dogs than they are like the wolf at all. So a couple of things to think about why dogs fit into our family so well and what's happened with domestication. There are some similarities in behaviour with the wolf, but really I think there's many, many differences. And remember as a species, they actually separated 150,000 years ago. It's a bit like, you know, our ancestors might have been, well, were Neanderthal man, but you know, Homo sapiens are very different from Neanderthals, or so I like to believe anyway. So it's very important that we don't think of the wolf as um, the same species as dogs because over time, over that domestication process, things have changed from what we, um, what we used to see in the wolf and still see in that wolf, but what we don't see in dogs anymore. So the domestic dog, let's talk about its social behaviour. There's two dogs having a little talk to each other. Um, dogs live in groups and they're usually related, um, but they don't live in packs. In fact, interestingly now, the research has shown that wolves don't actually live in packs either. They live in family groups. So when anybody tells you that, you know, you have to be the leader of the pack, probably they haven't read any scientific literature that's been written in the last 40 years or so. So dogs are very social, there's no doubt about it. They like to live in a group, they don't like to live by themselves, but we don't think of them as pack animals per se. Generally, this group of individuals that lives together, um, you see two to four individuals living in that group of dogs and the group is relatively stable. Um, as they're often related um, because it might be mum and the kids. And when people talk about a hierarchy, um, the hierarchy in dogs, as it is in wolves, as it is in most social species, is based on deference. It's not about being alpha or dominant. Um, we know there's no such thing as a dominant dog per se. And in fact, really the alpha dog doesn't exist either. Um, but there's always going to be a leader in any group. And this is when we talk about hierarchies. We're talking about um, what may happen in a group of individuals. And in any social group, somebody has to make decisions. You know, in a family group, it might be that dad makes decisions about one thing, mum makes decisions about another, the kids make a decision about something else. Um, you know, in, in, in any sort of social group of any individuals, somebody has to be the decision-making person. And the same with dogs or wolves. Someone might know where the best food is, some individual might know where the best resting place is. And what deference mean is, 
we follow who knows best. So it's not like I am going to lead this group. It's, well, actually, you actually do know more about this, so you can take the group for this particular uh, task that we might need to be uh, doing. So that's social behaviour. Now, if we talk about greeting behaviour, whether we're talking about, again, dogs or wolves, but in dogs um, is, I guess, want to be my focus for tonight. It's highly ritualised. It is in wolves as well, but it's highly ritualised in dogs because that means there's less chance of miscommunication. Um, they know what to expect from the ritual. There's very complex visual signals that they give each other so they can tell. And if you look at the picture there, you can see that those two dogs are communicating with each other, um, but it's not necessarily going to be a friendly outcome. It really depends on what the dog on the left is gonna do. Um, and the dog on the left to me looks like, well, I don't, I'm not really a threat. But the one on the right says, I'm frightened. You can see with the ears back, I'm very worried. And with that highly ritualised greeting behaviour and looking at their body language in general, we can certainly, um, uh, I guess what we're talking about with ritualised greeting behaviour is minimise any sign of conflict. So this is what we usually see with dogs when they greet each other, they sniff front to back. Um, and you've probably seen this lots of times when dogs greet each other. Um, some dogs find it a very personal thing to do, but this is how they sniff out the other dog to work out, you know, are you a friend? Where have you come from? What have you eaten? And that's a very ritualized behavior. If one dog doesn't know the ritual, that's where we run into problems. Um, same thing, sniffing, it happens to even royalty. This is how dogs greet people. We as humans often don't like that, but this is actually what happens in dogs. Very important to check out where you've been um, and what kind of signals and smells you might be giving. Luckily, the queen is a animal lover. So, territorial behaviour, that's certainly very important in dogs. Um, and You'll see in a minute why it's important in people as well, but we see that in, in wolves as well as in dogs. There's a lot of scent marking when dogs go out um, and they uh, cock their legs, the male dogs and some female dogs also cock their legs. So there's nothing abnormal about that. What they're trying to do is put the scent, the pheromones up as high as they possibly can. Um, and it's to say, hey, I've been here and I'm important. And I always joke that when I see dogs going out on, a, on the street on a walk, they should be allowed to sniff and check things out because while we get on email, they should be getting on P-mail. Um, there's very complex visual signals they give each other when they're marking, this is my area, this is where I live, this is where it's important for me to be. Uh, and again, we've got to look at their body language when they're doing this because they are talking to each other. Usually they're giving us signals too. Unfortunately, as humans, we're probably not as good at reading some of those body language signals as we should be. So I guess when you look at this dog, you've got a fair idea of what his body language is saying. Um, I'm not comfortable with you. People often think this dog is being aggressive. Well, I don't know if this dog is being aggressive. He's certainly saying, I'd be more comfortable if you moved away um, and I don't really want you to come and pat me, but he might be protecting his territory. He may be protecting, or he or she may be protecting a mate. It's all about, you know, um, how I'm feeling emotionally at any particular time. What's happened with domestication, and they were the similarities with dogs and wolf behavior. Um, we've seen dogs increase their vocalizations. They're, most of us who've owned dogs know that dogs have all sorts of different sounds they make for different things. You can tell when your dog's barking because he's alarmed. You can tell when your dog's barking or making some sort of whining nose, noise when he's excited. You can tell from the different vocalizations um, what he was doing, but in, in the more, um, in the ancestral dogs and certainly in the dog, in the wolf, um, they, don't, they don't make as much noise. Remember, we wanted dogs as an early warning system 
system. So we shouldn't be surprised that there's a lot more vocalizations that we have with dogs. And what's been interesting, a lot of studies now show that domestication isn't a one-way street. It was actually co-domestication. We were domesticated along with the dog and that's why we evolved to live together so well. There's been changes in their body language and that's obvious because if you look at that dog, he's got floppy ears, you know, and I'm just amazed that dogs are able to speak at least 400 languages. I certainly don't, but dogs have to be able to read the difference between the prick-eared dog and the floppy-eared dog, the dog with a tail that's carried high, a tail that's carried low, long hair, short hair. I mean, that body language of dogs is just fascinating, and yet most of the time they get it right. And again, facial expressions are really important. Uh, and dogs have learnt with domestication that there's certain different facial expressions. And there's been some really interesting studies looking at how dogs can move their eyebrows so that they uh, actually relate more to the way we can move our eyebrows and have quizzical looks. And that's something that the, the ancestral dog cannot do. And if you look at this dog, well, I'm not so sure that he's going to be able to move his eyebrows quite as effectively as some other breeds. But this is what we've done through domestication is to change the body language and the facial expressions of these dogs quite dramatically. So what's similar in behaviour um, with dogs that, and with people? Well, our social behaviour, we live in groups, usually related. We live in families, not packs, and that's exactly how the wolf lives in, in family groups. And wild dogs certainly live in family groups. We don't think of them as living in packs. People generally live in groups of two to six individuals, um, though our, as our life um, <clears throat> uh, as changes, that is changing a bit as well. But usually in humans, that's what we live in, groups of two to six individuals. And the group is relatively stable. I mean, it doesn't mean um, we always live with um, <clears throat> our families. If we're kids, we tend to move out. Some of us get divorced, some of us not. But generally, most groups are relatively stable. And the, we also have a fluid hierarchy based on deference. There's no alpha. It's all about we follow, you know, who knows best. So Danny is a specialist in dermatology. Um, I would always defer to Danny and say, hey, Dr. Houlihan, you're going to have to help me with this case because this dog is itching, but, you know, that's not my specialty. But I'd like to think that if Danny had a dog that had problems with its emotional uh, emotions or it's with its behaviour, that she might listen to me. But neither one of us for alpha. We just know that we have different areas that where our expertise may be needed. So if I go somewhere and not been before and I want a cup of coffee, I would always ask a local where the best coffee place is because I have no idea. It doesn't mean they're being dominant or alpha, they just know better than I do. Um, similarities in behaviour with people, um, we have a highly ritualised greeting behaviour and I found it quite interesting when I was thinking about this with COVID-19. Um, our ritual when we meet people is generally to shake hands. Now obviously that's not um, advised at this stage but that's a ritual that we generally do when we meet people we don't know. We hello, we, we shake their hands. Um, we don't generally rush up to people we don't know and rub noses with them. But in some cultures, that's the highly ritualized behavior. And that highly ritualized handshake, when we ever go back to doing that with people again, um, what that tells us is we know what to expect. If you put your hand out, the other person, if they want to say hello to you, will put their hand out. So it minimizes conflict. Um, there's usually complex visual signals when we greet people. Um, our facial expression and our body language tells people if we're happy to talk to them or not, whether we just need to keep moving on. And humans' facial expressions are very, very complex. Uh, and that's certainly the same as with our domestic dogs as well. Uh, and this is a really nice photo. I love this, where the dog and the human shows you how co-domestication has worked. They're both using similar sort of expressions to communicate with each other. When we talk about territorial behaviour, well, humans are pretty territorial. We mark our territories, perhaps not using the same ways that dogs um, and cats might do, but we generally put a fence around our garden. We say, this is my house. We put a door on the front, we put a door in the front of our house to say, yep, this is inside the house, that's outside the house. So we mark the territory. Um, if you've got kids, they often want to put, this is my room, do not enter. 
um, <clears throat> knock before you enter. We do all of that stuff too. And we use very complex visual signs, um, uh, you know, often signs on our house to say, yep, this is my house. And again, there's a lot of body language when we're talking about our territorial behaviour. And we've all had that experience of meeting someone who stands a little bit too close. Well, hopefully now we all know about the 1.5 metre rule, but now that's being relaxed, you remember people that they came and stand too close to, they're getting into our personal space and our territory and that makes us feel uncomfortable, same as the domestic dog. So if you understand that your dog and you have very many similarities in the way that you greet each other, the way that you mark your territory, you know, you've, whatever you believe is yours, then um, I think you'll have a much happier relationship with your dog, understanding that we're very similar. But with domestication, physical appearance and behaviour have been modified and they are still being changed as time goes on. Most importantly, I want you to think about dogs as not wolves. Um, there are different species, they separated a long time ago. Um, and as I said earlier, even though you know our ancestors may have been Neanderthal man, it does not mean that hopefully we behave like that. Um, things have evolved, things have moved on, and wolves are fabulous creatures, but we should not think that um, dogs are the same. <laughs> The other thing that I think is really important um, to recognise about dog behaviour is dogs are social animals and I talked about that quickly before and they like to be part of a social group but even more than that they have a need to be with their social group so they're, um, they're obligate in the fact that they have to be with others, they are not um, I guess being bred or designed, if that's the right word for it, um, to be by themselves. So they have to be with their owners or pet parents, as um, I heard Dr. Houlihan talking about. Um, they can't be just put in the backyard by themselves because that is not natural or normal for dogs. They live with company, whether it would be people or other animals. Um, one of the things that we do find problems with dogs who are left alone by themselves, that is not natural um, or normal for dogs. So they need company and that's really, really important to remember. Dogs are very interactive um, and play contributes to their social bonding. They like playing with each other. Um, and if you have two dogs, you'll know that if they get on and that's the if, um, they will often play, but their play bouts um, don't tend to last hours and hours and hours all in one go. When dogs play, they play a little bit, then they stop, they kind of regroup. Hmm, you want to play some more? Yep, they can go on again. So there's always that pause in dog behaviour. So when you're playing with your dog, it's important to take that pause too. And this is why if you want to bond with your puppy, your new puppy, or even a dog that you've got that's older, um, you can use play behaviour for social bonding because we want to be bonded with our pets. We want to be, um, be able to interact with them, um, but it should be fun and play is lots and lots of fun. Just a comment about cats. Um, cats don't play for very long periods of time, you know, and often people get frustrated because they're used to taking their dog to the park and throwing the ball for it for an hour. A cat would probably not on average play more than five or six minutes at a time. So just remember there's differences in species in, in their expectations as well. So let's go on um, and talk a couple of, uh, about a couple of other things. So why do they actually do the things they do? And for me, it's really important that people understand um, you know, the background of where the dog came from, where it evolved, because it makes it easy for us to understand why they might do certain things if they live with us. So we're going to take a short walk in their paws and we're going to have a look at how dogs see the world. Dogs have the same senses as us, um, but different. Uh, obviously, we talk about the sense of sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch, and we're going to go through each of these quite briefly, but again, to help you understand um, why your dog might be doing the things it's doing. So if we look at canine sight, um, dogs have colour vision. People often ask me, do they see in colour? Yep, they do, but they see more like red, green, colour blind people do. So if you look at the colours the dog can see and what we can see, you can see there's a vast difference. Um, Dogs um, are very sensitive to moving objects, they're predators, 
often when I take my little dog for a walk, there'd be a rabbit across the road. She won't see it until the rabbit moves and whoa, then she's onto it. Um, they have poor, poor close up vision and I'll show you a slide on that in a minute that will help you understand that bit better. Um, and they have poor binocular vision. Again, this is what they see with both eyes. Um, but they have really good night vision. And the reason they have good night vision is they can't see colours as well. There's things called rods and cones in the eye. And cones are the receptors in the eye that help you see colour. And dogs don't have that many of them um, as we do. So therefore, uh, they are able to see in dim light. They cannot see in total darkness, but they see in dimmer light better than we do. And if you look at the spectrum of colours that dogs see compared to us, um, it always amuses me that a lot of dog toys are red. And if you can see what red looks like to a dog, it looks pretty much like green. And it always makes me kind of amused that most of the dog toys are made for humans because they look attractive to us. But the average red ball on the average green grass your dog may not actually be able to see it. So when we sometimes think, oh, the dog can't see it. Yeah, actually, your dog can't see it. I love this um, this slide. I'm sorry it's so old, but um, it's the comparative vision of man and dogs. And if you look on the left, you can see a dog with a long nose, maybe like a shepherd. The one in the middle has got a short nose, perhaps like a pug, and the human is on the right. So the white area is what you can see with one eye. So the dog on the left can see all that part uh, on the left, that white area with his left eye, all that other part on the right with his right eye. The one in the middle, again, can't see as far back behind as the dog with the long nose. And people, we can't see behind us at all. We have very small area that we see with our light, right or left eye. The black area is actually what you see with both eyes. So we see most things in binocular view. We can actually see uh, most things quite clearly uh, in front of us because we use both eyes to do that. The pug doesn't have as much um, binocular vision, but more than the shepherd does on, well, the long-nosed dog anyway, on the left. But if you look in front of the nose of the dog on the left and the dog in the middle, you can see there's kind of a, a whitish area there. Well, that's called a blind spot. The dog can't actually see anything in front of their nose. And often when people drop a bit of food on the ground and the dog can't see it, well, they can't see it because their nose gets in the way. So don't think your dog is stupid because it can't see something in front of it. It physically can't do it. Hearing, dog's hearing is thought to be at least four times uh, more acute than that of humans. It means um, that they can hear ultrasound and infrasound. They've got ears that can move around. Um, and then, you know, if you've got a dog, sometimes and I, I find it's really cute when the dog's listening to something, it tilts its head on one side, tilts its head on the other side. Because what the dog is trying to do is work out where that sound is coming from. Um, they hear higher frequency in us. And as I said, they hear ultrasound. And so often when people report to me that the dog is reacting to something, the dog is probably hearing something that we have no ability to, to hear whatsoever. So it's really important to understand that the world that your dog lives in is very different from yours. The canine sense of smell is really phenomenal. I mean, I just can't even imagine what it must be like to live in that world of scents and odours that the dog lives in. And this is its most predominant sense. It's thought to be at least a thousand times more acute than that of humans. Um, and they can detect very low concentrations and they have really good ways of telling which smell is which and which smell is, is, is um, and something different. Um, and one of the things that really fascinates me about dogs, and I read a paper published on this and it's stuck in my mind forever, that if you leave your fingerprints on a pane of glass, your dog can tell it's your fingerprints six weeks later. I don't even know what a fingerprint smells like. So I just am fascinated that the dog can detect those smells at such low concentrations for such a long time. Uh, and the other thing that we've got to remember is the dogs also have um, a scent organ that we don't. It's called a vomeronasal organ or an organ of Jacobson. It sits in the roof of the mouth and it allows the dog to taste smells and it allows them to scent pheromones and all sorts of things that we can't do. And I just think 
the world that dogs live in must be one of the most fascinating things. I can't even get my brain around what their world must be like. But that's obviously why we use them for customs dogs. Um, you know, if you've ever travelled overseas, if we ever get back to doing that again, and well, even you don't have to go overseas. Um, I went down to Tasmania and the customs dogs there were sniffing for fruit. And these dogs can tell that you're carrying fruit. They'll let you bring biscuits in, but you can't have meat, you can't have cheese, but there's all sorts of other foods that they have been trained so specifically. Uh, and I just think that's a phenomenal trait that we have, and we're lucky to have dogs that can help us when we are not equipped to do some of that stuff. And don't be surprised if you leave your pizza on the counter that the dog might help itself. Remember, I said at the beginning, we wanted dogs to be our garbage disposal system. Well, I guess if you've left it there, it's fair game for the dog. And so often we can get upset about dogs doing things that we really, you know, we probably should have learned not to leave the pizza there in the first place. But the bottom line is, this is what we wanted them to do from the get go. Their sense of taste um, is relative, relatively poorly developed compared to the other senses. Um, they like sweet things, but they shouldn't have chocolates as we all should know. Um, interesting, if a dog is gonna eat something, it's gotta smell right. Does, probably makes a lot of sense when you think that's their most important uh, scent of all is the sense of smell. Um, then it's gotta feel right in its mouth, then the taste comes live, um, last. And if we think about that, uh, it's probably not that different to us. I always think about, you know, when there's a fresh apple and I can smell that apple and it just smells so good and you bite into it and it's all flowery and soft and horrible. It doesn't feel right in the mouth. You know, we sometimes even don't know what it tastes like because the texture is not what you expect. So it's the same with dogs. It's got to smell right, then the texture's got to be right, then taste comes after that. There was a paper I read a while ago where somebody called dogs lazy eaters. Basically, they like soft foods, but not chewy foods. So, you know, if they can get the food down fast, even better. Um, they eat during the day. Usually, that's certainly what I was taught at university. That's not always what happens at night. Um, in real life, there are some dogs, like my dogs, they like to um, have a midnight snack. So I leave food out for them and they will go and, you know, help themselves somewhere between probably two and four in the morning. Uh, and But most dogs will eat um, mostly during the day. But normal for dogs is to eat at least three times a day. Sometimes we get indoctrinated with, oh, you feed your dog once a day or twice a day. Puppies we feed more frequently, but really it's normal for the dogs to have three kind of meals a day. Doesn't mean three you know, meals that are full of all calories. The calorie content in a 24 hour period should be the same, but it is normal for dogs to have more than one meal a day. Their sense of touch is well developed um, and they certainly feel pain. There's no doubt that um, they feel physical pain just like we feel physical pain. I put this um, photo in <clears throat> just to remind me to tell you that not all dogs like being cuddled. And it's one of the, um, the things that we often forget that dogs are introverts, they can be extroverts. But <clears throat> this little puppy is I think what I would call tolerating being in this little boy's lap. But is he really enjoying it? I don't know. And not all dogs like to be cuddled. If people think that all dogs like to be cuddled, that's if we're not reading their body language, that is where we can come unstuck and we can end up getting bitten because just because we like cuddling, the dog might not. Um, nothing wrong with the dog. It's just like some people, are, you know, a cuddly kind of people, other people are not. We have introverts and extroverts in our world. We have the same in the dog world. So um, always important to read the dog's body language to say what you're doing with the dog. Is that what your dog likes at this particular instant in time? And when we're talking about body language, what we're doing is looking at the position of the ears. We're looking at the position of the tail. Is it up or down? Is it wagging? Please don't think a wagging tail means your dog is friendly. No, a wagging tail just means I'm willing to interact, but it doesn't mean the interaction is necessarily going to be friendly. Um, 
the position of the head, the body posture, if it's leaning forward, backwards, facial expression, and what the eyes are doing, if the pupils are dilated, all of those things can tell you whether the dog is feeling comfortable or not in any particular situation. So this little dog, I kind of think it's cute, um, but this little dog looks pretty comfortable on his deck chair. Um, and, and that's what we want our dogs to be comfortable when we do things. Body language, another thing I want to just uh, help you with setting your dog up for success is most people look at that picture and go, oh, how cute, doesn't he look guilty? No, dogs don't feel guilt. Um, and mostly what we're seeing here is what we call appeasement gestures. The dog's saying, uh-oh, it looks like I might get into trouble, but really it's got nothing to do with what I've done. I'm just showing you my look this way, so hopefully you won't reprimand me. And this is a very old cartoon from Fred Bassett, but it probably, you know, I guess illustrates what we're talking to, talking about. The owners come out and said, Fred, what have you been up to in the kitchen? Nothing, says Fred. Have you been stealing something? You look like you've been up to no good. I haven't done a thing. Honest, says Fred. Well, it's that harsh tone of yours brings out the guilty look in me. And there's been lots and lots of studies now showing it's the way we react to things that brings out that guilty look, which is that appeasement look I showed you before. The dog has no concept of what it is that they've necessarily done wrong, but certainly it's that, uh-oh, somebody's yelling at me, now it's time to hide. So that was a quick run through on um, <clears throat> on uh, body language. But another thing that I think is important to remember is when we talk about behaviour, um, behaviour is determined by genetics, learning and the environment. So there's three things that, that aren't separate scenarios. People talk about nurture versus nur uh, nature versus nurture. It's not that simple. Genetics is very complex. It's not just what you inherit from your mother, your father, your parents, your grandparents. Um, in dogs, there's been studies showing that the way that the dog's mother, the bitch, was treated during pregnancy will have an effect on the behaviour of the puppies. In other species, it's been shown that the way the grandmother of that particular individual was treated during pregnancy has an effect on behaviour. Um, hormones, when they're in the womb, um, can also affect behaviour. So genetics and epigenetics are much more complex than, oh, I've seen what the mum and dad look like, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean what their behaviour is going to be like. Learning, it's obvious we're all going to learn um, things from our experiences, good things. You might you know, you're more likely to do it again if something bad happens, you're less likely to do it again. So all the learning that we've had, good, bad or indifferent, is going to affect behaviour. And the particular environment you're in is going to affect the behaviour as well. And if anybody's had a dog with a thunderstorm phobia, you'll know when the weather's lovely, the dog's behaviour is very different from when um, thunderstorms happen. So behaviour is very, very complex. A couple of things that I uh, want to just mention before we start to round off the lecture is um, when do most behavioural changes occur? And most people have heard of the socialisation period, why it's really important to take your puppies to puppy preschool, or kittens to uh, kitten kindy. Uh, it's because in that socialisation period that happens between three weeks and 12 weeks, uh, this is the time where really it's the easiest for them to be socialised, which means learning to cope with other people in their environment, other animals in their environment. Also easiest to habituate them to things, get them used to traffic, to um, to vacuum cleaners and stuff. And the socialisation period is when we do see a lot of behavioural changes. Just to prepare you for the future, when dogs start to sexually mature, which is somewhere between six to 12 months, a bit early in cats, um, that's when you see changes, you know, which is when they're starting to go into their teenage years. And just like human teenagers, we're going to see some changes um, in that period with animals as well. And dogs, um, social maturity, when they psychologically grow up, usually somewhere between 18 months to 36 months. Um, so you might have a two-year-old dog that's still acting like a teenager, a two-and-a-half-year-old dog that's still acting like a teenager. And if you've ever lived with teenagers um, or 
of all being a teenager, as you'll know, um, that our behaviour is very different when you're 17 and you think you're invincible to when you're 27 and you realise that mm, maybe life is a little bit different. So recognise that happens with dogs and cats as well, um, that we are going to see behavioural changes and that's a time when you might need a bit of help. More than just training, you might need more help if there's other um, emotional psychological disorders. So what's okay? People often ask me, you know, should dogs be allowed to sit on the furniture or sleep on the bed? Um, is it a problem if they do that? And who's it a problem to? So let me tell you, I don't think it makes any difference if the dog's on the furniture or sleeps on the bed. It's up to you what you prefer. Um, my dog prefers to sleep in her own bed at night, but she likes to come down oh, usually about 7.30 in the morning and just hop into bed with us for a little bit. Uh, it's getting a bit earlier now that the weather's getting a bit colder, but really it's up to you. There's nothing about what's right or wrong about that. Um, it isn't going to make them dominant, and that's what people um, used to think uh, a long time ago. They used to think that if you allowed the dog on the bed, you would have all sorts of problems. But realistically, uh, it's it's your personal choice what you would prefer. And once you set those sort of boundaries of what you would expect from your dog or your cat, for that matter. Um, then stick to it. But all of those things about eating first or going through the door first, that's just really manners. It's really got nothing to do with whether the dog's going to develop behaviour problems or not. So most of the things that I see that people have problems with their dogs, um, if the dog pees or poops in places that the owner doesn't like or the pet parent doesn't like, obviously being aggressive, <laughs> who wants to have an animal um, or a person in their life that's aggressive, um, boisterous behaviour. You know, we see this a lot in puppies and there was a study done many years ago that showed that the dog that was both boisterous and bouncing around was more likely to be surrendered than the dog that was very quiet. Uh, but boisterous behaviour is normal. We just need to work out how we're going to teach that dog manners. Pulling on the lead, people don't like that quite, quite, um, uh, I, I quite understandably. Dogs that jump up, um, dogs that bark, dogs that dig up the backyard. Um, issues with toilet training is a real problem um, when, when the dog doesn't learn that. Uh, and sometimes it's the way we go about training them that can lead to issues. And, and, of the, and also we have problems with noises. Cats, Peeing, pooping in unacceptable places is the top reason why people get rid of their cats. Aggressive behaviour, scratching furniture, um, play behaviour. Again, I touched on it earlier that cats sort of play very intensely and then stop. But if the cat doesn't know the difference between play and predative behaviour because they haven't had the opportunity to learn that, that can be a real problem as well. Um, Vocalisation, you know, we have lots of complaints about dogs that bark, but we certainly have complaints about cats that make a lot of noises as well. And fearful behaviour, um, that is problematic. So if if any of your pets show any of these problems, um, first step, see your vet to rule out any medical issues because physical issues will certainly affect all those behaviours. Your vet will need to do a clinical examination. They may also need to do some blood tests and other tests. Um, and if they've ruled out that everything there physically is fine, um, then you might need to see a trainer or you might need to see um, a, a hopefully a trainer that only uses positive reinforcement or you might need to see a vet with qualifications in behaviour to help you. But just a couple of things about pulling on the lead. This is a very common problem. Dogs do learn to pull, um, but they can learn not to pull, but um, not in five minutes. And ideally, you teach the dog how you want them to walk on a loose lead. I don't think dogs should heal when they take when you take them for a walk. I think dogs should be able to sniff, you know, get on the P-mail, find out what's happening in the world. Um, but if they shouldn't be pulling you from one end of the world to the other. Uh, I think it's really important that if you have a dog that pulls, don't put it on a collar like that poor dog on the right. Um, front attaching harnesses are great for dogs. Those extender leads, um, uh, studies just come out showing that they can cause real problems for dogs. You know, the ones where they clip and unclip because it, that can cause physical harm in dogs. So again, just a, a normal uh, lead that's the same length, front attaching harness, most dogs can be managed really nicely like that. Jumping up, 
don't ignore the behaviour you want. People often tell you to ignore the dog that's jumping up. The dog needs to know what you want. Ignoring does not make a behaviour go away because it's going to be frustrating to the dog and you haven't actually taught the dog what's expected. It's always better to teach a different behaviour. My dog knows four on the floor. Um, and I teach, taught that to my dog when she was calm. When she's all excited, that's not the time she's going to learn that. So when the dog is calm, she learns to sit, four on the floor, and then she can have all the interaction that she wants. Um, and remember, if the dog is sitting, it really just can't jump. Very important, and this applies not only to jumping up, but for everything, always reward calm behaviour. I think we get so focused on always wanting the dog to sit or stay or do something. In fact, when the dog's just lying around in front of the heater, like uh, my friend's dogs here, those dogs are having a great time. This is when we should be telling them what good dogs they are. You're doing exactly what I want you to do, being nice and calm and relaxed and rewarding that rather than paying attention to them all the time when they're doing the things that frustrate us. Um, barking, fairly common problem, but remember, we bred dogs to bark. They're our early warning system. I like my dogs when they bark, when they someone comes to the house, but I also like them to, okay, that's enough. Now you've told me, now you need to be quiet. So remember, barking is a normal behaviour. It's a form of communication. Therefore, it can't be stopped entirely. And in fact, it's probably detrimental to try and stop the behaviour because not only is it normal and natural, this is what we wanted the dog to do. The dog just needs to have a stop signal when it knows Yep, that's enough now. Um, some dogs bark more than others. There's certainly some breeds were bred to bark because we wanted them to do that. Um, but remember, it's a form of communication. So it's really important. We respect that the dog is actually telling us something. So some of the reasons um, we see for dogs barking is excitement. My dog certainly squicks, as I call it, when I come home, when she's greeting me, um, as a warning when someone comes to the door when dogs are scared. Um, people used to talk about attention-seeking behaviour. Dogs don't attention-seek, they're looking for information. And if you're not giving them the information that they need, yep, they might vocalise when they're highly aroused and certainly dogs in pain will make some noise. So, you know, it's not just a simple thing, oh, my dog's barking, there's a lot of reasons why that might happen. Um, dogs, I think, need to be trained to remain home alone. Uh, that's really important that their dogs, although they're um, obligate social creatures, does not mean that they don't have to learn that some time alone may well be necessary because we all have to go out somewhere, whether it's to work or the shops or just for an appointment. Um, and when they're going to be home alone, they need to learn that being home alone quietly is absolutely fine. And it's easiest to start with a puppy. So all dogs need sufficient mental as well as physical stimulation. That's really, really important. Um, so walks are a good way to do this, but they're not the only way to do it. Not all dogs like walks, and that's important to remember. Some dogs find the big world out there is a little bit scary. Um, but toys, interactive games, agility, um, things like nose work are fabulous things for dogs to have to help them um, be mentally as well as physically stimulated. So just some key points to finish up with. Um, I think it's really important to teach good manners. Uh, you know, if you want to go and do obedience training, that's fine, but it's a competition, a sport. Um, I just think dogs need good manners. And if we think about good manners for people, we say hello and goodbye, we say please and thank you. And if we have those attributes, people think that we're well-mannered people. For dogs, I think if your dog can come, sit, drop, stay and be calm on cue when you ask them. That's really good manners for dogs. There's not much else that we really need to do because that is exactly what we want most well-mannered dogs to be. Training, if you're going to work with training with your dog, the basic principles is reward is more effective than punishment. Um, in fact, punishment really has no role in training whatsoever. And studies have shown that some forms of training that include punishment can actually increase the chances of some dogs um, becoming more aggressive by 25%. And there's really no reason for that. So lots of rewards, lots of praise, um, lots of patience, especially with young dogs. They, you know, we all need people to be patient um, uh, with us when we're learning something new, same with dogs. To break it into small, easy steps, be really consistent when you work with your dog, same applies to cats for that matter. Never punishment. And 
always make it fun. Working with your dog or your cat, because you can train cats as well, um, should be lots of fun. With young animals, puppy classes and kitten classes are really good ways to learn some techniques on how to teach your dog some manners, um, how to handle them. And if we go to puppy classes and kitten classes and we use lots of rewards, we have better behaved dogs and better behaved cats. So with that, I'm going to say thank you for your attention. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Dr. Sexel, for the webinar. So we do have a few questions that have come through. Um, so the first question is, um, the attendee has adopted a new kitten and an adult dog from their local shelter, um, and they're wondering what the best way to introduce them to each other is. So it's a new kitten and an adult dog. Wow, that's taking a lot on in one go, isn't it? Um, fabulous that you adopted them from the shelter, but the answer is slowly. Slowly, slowly, slowly. Uh, I'd give them all what I'd call both of them their core territory where they know it's theirs, uh, eat, sleep, rest, uh, and um, where they can play. Cats, it's really important that they have somewhere up high to get away from. Um, they need an escape route. If you've got an adult dog, you may not know if it's ever had good interactions with cats. If they have, they can live together. Uh, quite nicely in harmony, but I always think cats need an escape route and because cats can jump higher and they actually like being up high, um, that's what I'd always make sure. But slowly, lots of rewards, have the dog on lead, give them both treats. And so the, the association they have with each other is, wow, aren't you wonderful? Great to have you part of my life. Hope that Great. Answers the and question. then um, the next question. That's perfect, Kirsty. And the next question is, um, is there a good resource for toilet training? The attendee lives in a small apartment and they can't always take their dog outside straight away to go to the toilet. Look, there's lots of ways you can do that. And there are lots of good resources. Um, some um, uh, shelter websites have that, uh, have them there. With apartment training, uh, with apartments and toilet training dogs, I really like dogs to learn how to ring a bell, to say, I need to go. I've rung the bell. Can I go out in the balcony or can you take me out? So that they actually give you some signal uh, about the fact that they need, and that can be done using rewards. Sometimes using puppy pads and pee pads can be useful if you get caught short, because sometimes your puppy's going to need to go and you're not going to be there or you can't stop everything to you know if they've rung the bell and you need to go at that point so having an area that the dog knows the pup knows that this is where I can go if need be um, and I'm going to get rewarded for this so um, one of the things just to be knowledgeable about I suppose is dogs develop what we call a substrate preference when they're young which means they learn to eliminate on certain surfaces so if your pup has only ever eliminated on concrete, it can be really hard to convince them that grass is where you need to take them. So this is why always having treats, 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 that whenever they pee or poop where you want them to do it, you give them treats. Not too much effusive praise. I think sometimes with young animals, they can get easily distracted. And if you go, oh, that's just the best thing I've ever seen, um, the dog can be distracted. So it's better to wait till they finish tell them they're a good kid, give them some praise with doing that. But that's what I, um, why I was mentioning that if they get used to puppy pads, then sometimes they may not go on grass if that's where you want them to go. Uh, so that's why I like to take them out so they get used to being on different surfaces, but the puppy pad or the pee pad can be a good place um, to be fall back on uh, if, if you can't be there all the time. But again, a lot of uh, behaviour websites um, will have good resources on toilet training. Uh, I don't know that AVBIG, the Australian Veterinary Behaviour Inter Interest Group has that, but I certainly know that the American AVSAB group has that. Um, there's lots of different places, um, but make sure they focus on positive reinforcement, rewarding the training, um, and that's, you know, it's patience. The other thing I might quickly mention there is not all dogs have full bladder control um, by the time they're 12 or 16 weeks of age. There are some dogs and it's quite normal that they may not have full sphincter control of their bladder until almost six months of age. Uh, it's not common. Most dogs are able to be um, toilet trained early in that, um, but some of them, you know, it's like potty training kids. I guess some learn it faster than others 
and we just need to be cognizant of that. But always reward the right thing. Never, ever, ever punish if they get it wrong. Um, because remember, elimination is self-rewarding. Every time you go to the bathroom, you feel better. You know, it's just an emotional response of oh, relief. And it happens with the animals too. So that's why you always want to reward them. Never punish and certainly don't rub their nose into it. Thanks, Kirsty. Those were great tips. Um, and now we have a question about a nervous little dog. So this dog is not a fan of going on walks. The dog becomes very anxious uh, when they're on walks and um, the attendee has tried giving them treats, but the dog becomes so nervous on the walk that they won't accept the treats. Um, any tips for making walks a more pleasant experience? <clears throat> okay. I don't think dogs need to go for walks. I've said it. <laughs> I've said it thousands of times. Dogs need physical and mental stimulation, but some dogs are really fearful and nervous and anxious on walks, and they literally don't enjoy it. And the best thing is don't take them for a walk. I used to think that was sacrilege because I was brought up in Australia and we've always been told, you know, if you don't take your dog for at least 20 minutes twice a day, you're a bad dog owner. But I lived in upstate New York for a while, and I can tell you it was minus 60 with wind chill. The snow was up to the eaves of the house nobody walked their dog. Didn't mean the dogs didn't get physically and mentally stimulated and exercised, but walking wasn't the way to do with it. So don't feel bad about not taking your dog for a walk because sometimes you'll just see the relief in the dog's faces. Oh, I just am too worried about that. There's too much traffic. There's too many other things. You know, I'm scared of heights. I feel so much relief at not having to go base jumping or abseiling. Making me do those things is not gonna make my fear any better. Um, and treats, if your dog won't take treats, it tells you that your dog is too scared and too nervous. And the easiest thing is just don't do it. The dog doesn't, it doesn't need to go out for a walk. And that's kind of a fallacy that we've, where I just see a lot of dogs really, really struggle and a lot of owners feel really, really guilty. And, you know, it's okay for the dog to say, no, I don't want to do that. But it doesn't let you off the hook of giving that dog physical and mental stimulation. You can play games, you can do all sorts of, um, you know, hide and seek games, you can get the dog to chase balls and all sorts of things. And it doesn't have to be in that big, scary outside world out there. Hope that helps you mate, feel better. That's great advice, Kirsty. Um, now we have another question. We've got a young puppy. This pup's only 12 weeks old and our attendee would like to know if that's too early to start training. To start training? Is that what I heard? Training in general. That's right, yep. Absolutely not. I mean, I would start training the puppy. If I was breeding dogs, I would start training them to do basic things. In fact, they know how to do most of the things. We just haven't, you know, put words to them like sit and stay. They can do that as soon as their eyes and ears open. But no, 12 weeks is absolutely not too young. Eight weeks is not too young. In fact, it's never too young to start teaching manners and that's what it's all about. So no, 12 weeks is a good time to go to puppy school, good time to learn things. Um, just don't want to make them too complex. I mean, it's like, you know, if you have a five-year-old child, you're probably not going to teach them Einstein's theory of relativity. Um, well, maybe for some five-year-olds, most five-year-olds I know aren't going to do that but basic manners absolutely at 12 years the 12 weeks of age go for it have fun lots of treats oh you'll enjoy it it'll be fabulous Perfect. And then our final question for this evening, we've got another attendee who has a young puppy who likes to um, bite and bark when they get excited. Um, and they're wondering how they prevent that from becoming a habit. Yeah, that's a very, very common problem within puppies. And this is why I like teaching calm. I think, you know, we're so focused on coming and sitting and dropping. If you actually work on teaching calm and rewarding nice, calm behaviour, um, that's in, that's really important thing to teach. And um, most good puppy schools now teach that as, as their number one thing to teach the dog, that go to your mat, nice and calm, and then you don't have that escalation into nipping, biting, jumping. Um, and the problem is when you've got a young puppy, they've got really sharp little teeth, uh, but their jaws aren't very strong. When they get bigger, they've got sharp teeth, but their jaws are stronger. So 
I like to, um, if you've got a dog who's really mouthy, make sure there's lots of chew toys around for the dog to chew on. Remember as young puppies, they're actually exploring the environment with their mouth. Um, if you have, have had young kids, you know, everything goes into their mouth. They're exploring with their mouth and dogs are the same. Then they go through that teething period. Um, they need stuff to chew on. So always make sure there's toys that are suitable, that are um, not destructible, that they can chew on. Sometimes swapping them when you see the puppy coming up and you see it get really excited, say, oh, can you sit? Great, here's your toy, go and play with your toy. So you can actually use that excitable behavior, but get them to divert onto a toy. Um, teaching them some manners, you know, apart from calm, um, sit, here's a treat, have your toy, sit, have your treat, has a toy. One of the things I think that's really hard when you've got a very excitable puppy, it's very hard not to get excited yourself um, and go, ah! When, you know, when they do that, the best thing is just stay very calm. I really like to whisper to dogs because I think that really calms them down. And and as I said, teaching calm, top of the list that I would teach any puppy that they go to their mat. They can be crate trained uh, somewhere that they can be calm and quiet uh, and then have some excitable time when you've got a toy that you can play with them. Good luck. Thanks so much, Dr. Kirsty. So um, thank you all once again for all of those questions. Unfortunately, we're out of time today. Thank you all again for attending the webinar and we really hope you enjoyed the session. A very special thank you to Dr. Sexel for putting today's presentation together and for giving up her time to share her knowledge and experience with us. Please remember to register for the next webinar in our Pause and Learn series, also hosted by Dr. Kirsty Sexel. And this one's on separation anxiety. If you'd like to learn more about GAP Only, PetShore, or the Pause and Learn webinar series, please follow us on social or visit our website. Good evening, everyone.